Hello, and welcome to episode 39 of Charlotte Mecklenburg History with Dan Morrill. Today is Sunday, January 3rd, 2021, and I am Dan's daughter, Mary Dana, here with Dan through Zoom. We made it to 2021, Dad. Yeah, 2020 was really the pits. It was, and I, I, I was, was trying one, to think. I was one glad person to see that thing go. I'm not sure I got the episode number right. This might be 38. I don't know. But anyway. 39 is right. Okay. 39 is right. Okay. So uh, today. We're not getting paid, you know. Oh, you know, it's around. I know it's it's not episode right. 40. Right. So, right. Um, okay. So today you are going to be talking about the uh built environment no the african american history local african american history related to the built environment here in mecklenburg county sounds good to me Is that right okay yeah Just trying to word enough. that correctly it's close sure. enough so all right so i'll let you go ahead well let me say two or three things before i get started i'm going to talk about this statue that you see on the screen but that's that's a fascinating mystery but First of all, I'm going to take a leisurely pace. I'm sure I'm not going to get through. So when we get to 35, 36, 37 minutes, we'll just click it. And because it's going to, it's going to take more than one thing. And I don't want to rush. Okay. It's your show. The second thing I wanted to say was I, I really had thought I wouldn't do a podcast today. But I tell you, you know, I want everybody to understand that, um, you know, I'm definitely an historian, but I'm more an historic preservationist. And I'm primarily interested in the material culture. The built environment. Well, even broader than that, because you can say that this statue, which was obviously man-made, woman-made, human-made, is material culture. I'm interested in material culture, primarily in buildings and properties and so forth, but more broadly than that. And I'm also, as you know, many of you know that it's really ridiculously how often I mention that I'm interested in what a private nonprofit preservation group can add to the preservation movement in this part of North Carolina. And you also know that one of the reasons that I do these podcasts is to try to raise money. And there have been many, many weeks that I've really been very disappointed because even though we accept as little as $10 a year, nobody would contribute. Well, I got a wonderful contribution uh, this past week. I mean, it was just one of those things that I tell you, it, when, when you're trying to raise money, it's just so affirming when somebody makes a donation of any any amount. So with that, I thought I, I better do a podcast. And also, you know, I'm gonna start out talking about really one of the great things about being an historian. You know, the thing that's so intriguing in many ways about being an historian is doing research. And, you know, we've talked about interpretation and we've talked about narrative and we've talked about what it means to actually build a narrative from interpreting objects. So when you're trying to find out, when you're trying to gather facts, when you're trying to get data that you can use to make an interpretation, that's just, it's like a detective story. You know, I don't ever get bored because there's plenty of stuff out there to look at. So, and you've been involved in some historical research, Mary Dina. You know, you know sure. what I'm talking about, Al. And one, one answer leads to another question, to another question, to another question. You never really finish. Well, I am talking about African American history, and you know, we looked at. First of all, we looked at the Native Americans. And the Native American population of North Carolina is so small today 
that particularly when political power rests as it does in our country at the ballot box, the Native Americans, quite frankly, just have limited political power. Interestingly enough, then we talked about the Latinos, the Spanish-speaking people, and those indigenous people that basically intermarried with the Spanish. And we got, of course, this great mixture of people that makes up the Latino world today. And interestingly enough, particularly as far as the Eastern United States is concerned, you know, the first Latino people were the ones, that, this first Spanish were the ones that went with Hernando de Soto, who came in the 16th century. There are more Latinos in North Carolina now than there've ever been. It's the fastest growing non-white component of our population. In fact, it's even outstripping the African-American population. So that's interesting. But of course, the, the third large non-white group are the people who came from Africa. And of course, as with all human beings, they have their culture, they have their values, they have their traditions. And those, uh, those are shown in our built environment and in our material culture. So that's what I'm gonna be focusing on today. And I'm starting out with this statue, which is a fascinating story. And I'm gonna just spend maybe three or four minutes on it, kind of like we did with the Griffin at the beginning of one other episode. I've got an email from a woman who, by the way, Mary Dana said that she really does watch the podcast. Yeah, that's such happy news. And the Thank podcasts you. are making an impact. That's good. She said that she, when she was, she's now in her early 50s. She's about two years, two or three years older than you are. In 1989, she and her husband, when they were in their 20s, bought a house off Eastway Drive, and I'll show you the house in a minute, in a neighborhood that uh, the John Crossland Company built off Eastway Drive, which is still very much there today. The house is still there. And there was a big maple tree in the front yard, and it was so big that they felt they needed to take it down. And so they took this... Uh, maple tree down. And you know, when you take a big tree down, there's a, there's a root ball. You know, you've got roots mm -hmm. and then you've got dirt that's gathered around those roots. And in the root ball of this maple tree, when it was cut down in 1989, was this statue. Hmm. And, you know, she, she had absolutely, she still does. It, her husband, she and her husband sold the house in 2018. And rather tragically, her husband died the day after they signed the sales papers because they couldn't oh, take care of the house. Terrible. And she has some emotional sentiment regarding this statue. I mean, it's sure. it beyond what it is or what it represents or what it's about. And I actually asked her that she might consider donating it to Preserve Mecklenburg or to a museum or someplace that might want to try to find out what is it? What's going on here? What is this? Well, you know, I made a really stupid assumption when I first saw this statue. I saw this thing tied around its neck. I said, oh my goodness, they're lynching a black person because there's no there's no doubt about the fact that this person has the features of a black person because you can just tell that it does and i came to find out that's not what it was at all it didn't have anything to do with lynching it has to do with the fact that in a lot of african 
cultures, particularly women, are encouraged to sort of lengthen their necks mm -hmm. by wearing ne these neck adornments because a long neck is considered to be very attractive in some African cultures. So that's what this is. This is not a lynching. It's simply a figure that um, has this thing wrapped around it. I'll show you a couple of more pictures here. Here it is from the rear. And you can see it from the front. And she asked me, well, what's, what's, what, 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 what is this? Well, you know, Facebook is a very, very interesting, interesting phenomenon because there are a lot of people on Facebook. I have over 3,000 friends, about 33 friends. And you know, it's amazing what you can find out from people. And I put the word out there and I very quickly got back the fact and you can buy these similar looking things, by the way, on eBay. You can buy anything on eBay. This is probably a fertility um, statue. statue. Okay. Now we all know that fertility, the ability to be able to uh, produce children is uh, fundamental to human society. And, and fertility rights and fertility symbols are, you know, they're, they're, they're very common in many, many cultures. Now, one thing that's interesting about this figure is it looks like it originally was male. Or I'm, I'm now making some assumptions. I don't know. This is the kinds of things you do. But the as the as the writer of the email said, his presence has been removed. Now, what he means what <laughs> is that he. He has the genitalia is gone. Okay. Now, she said that that was true when she unearthed it because this was buried in the roots of that tree. Mm -hmm. And maybe, I don't know this for certain, maybe this was originally produced as a male figure and they wanted to make it into a female figure because that's who wore these chains around their necks and maybe they just cut the genitalia off. I don't know. Who knows? I don't know. Those are the kinds we of questions. <laughs> those are the kinds of questions that you always have to ask. Now, one of the questions is how old is this thing? When was it put there? Who put it there? She didn't put it there. She found it. Somebody buried this particular object. Now here is the house that they bought in uh, 1989. She was probably 23. Her husband was probably about 26. You know that stage of life, Mary mm -hmm. Dana, when you're just going, you can see people, by the way, commenting. On I, Facebook. I was going to see your Facebook time. notifications. Yeah, they're, or... they're on it all the time. Coming up. So, you know, this house was built by John Crosland. Now, we talked about John Crosland before. You know, he's one of these builders that was involved with building big new suburbs. And here, here, th this is not the greatest of, but you see, you see this green, you see the green? Yes. Well, that's, that's the lot. And the okay. street that it's on is on Sheffield Drive. And you'll note that it goes back to a big natural area behind it. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to Evergreen Cemetery, which is out on Central Avenue. But just to give you I some, or, just to give you some more, here's Eastway Drive. Eastway. And you can't quite see it right at the bottom, but there's, Independence, East Independence Boulevard's right down here. 
Like okay. if you go out East Independence Boulevard, going out of town, go under the Eastway Bridge, you go mm -hmm. up, you turn back in here, and you go to this lot right here. Okay. So that's where it is. Now, one of the things that's intriguing about it is it's got this big undisturbed natural area behind it. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't know. I, you know, and by the way, there's a creek close by too. Now that's very important, particularly if you're trying to think about something that goes way back because human beings have got to have water. And before you had city water, you either got it out of a well or you got it out of a creek. So having water nearby was extremely beneficial, like having a creek. Now I also put uh, a map here. Here's that same green area. See it? Mm -hmm. It it was there. There it is. See it right there? Mm -hmm. The green area. Now, if you pull out, here's Independence. East Independence. Okay. Andrew Jackson Memorial Highway, by the way, just for the record. And here's East yes. Way Drive. So you can see rough here's that here, here's the here's the lot you can see where this house happens to be now she told me that she thought that there was an old indian trading path that ran through her neighborhood and the evidence for that was she said there was there were big trees that lined a, a road well mm -hmm. She's right. Now, you remember when we were talking about Native Americans and we were talking mm -hmm. about the Mississippian culture and we were talking about the different tribes and we were talking about the Town Creek Indian man. Mm -hmm. You remember we also noted horses were not native to the African American culture. In fact, you mean the Native American culture? The Native American culture to the Native American. Right. They they are not native to North America. The, North America. Correct. 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 Also, Native Americans never used a wheel in transportation. Yeah, I knew that too. So the way that Native Americans traveled long distance for trade was they walked. Mm -hmm. Now, we noted before that this was not an empty place when the Spanish came, when Hernando de Soto came, when St. Augustine was established. Uh, you know, when San Juan Pardo, you know, they, they, this was not an empty place. And the reality is that there was a crisscrossing of Indian trading paths that were literally thousands of years old. And one of those is depicted by this line that, that I'm showing you going down here through Matthews. You know the town that everybody calls Indian Trail? Mm -hmm. The reason it's called Indian Trail is that this trading path that came from the upper Catawba River Valley, up around where present day Hickory is located. This trading path, which went down into South Carolina, came right through this neighborhood where this woman lived. And in fact, mm -hmm. Indian Trail is called Indian Trail because that's where the Indian Trail went. Okay, that makes sense. But now later, you'll see this referred to as Potter Road. Mm -hmm. Now there's some disagreement about why it was called Potter Road. And if you go down into Union County, you'll actually see a portion of it still called Potter Road is that in the late 18th century, late 1700s, early 1800s, there was a lot of commercial pottery making going on in what's now Lincoln County and Catawba County, North Carolina. Still is, by the way. And potters would use this trail to take their pottery down to Charleston. So you'll see it referred to later as 
Potter Road, but this road actually was much, much older than that. And it was Indian Trading Bank. Mm -hmm. Now you start putting all this together. Does this have the fact that there's a lot of open land, the fact there's this creek, the fact that there was an old trading road going through there, which meant that people would have lived along that road. Um, early settlers would have lived along that road. That would have been a very convenient thing to have. You know where the intersection of Eastway Drive and North Trine Street is? Yes. That's where these two big trading paths cross there. Oh. The, the Great Wagon Road and Potter's Road. And so oh. then you come up to say, okay, now, is is this something this house this neighborhood was built in the early 1960s was this something that some kid just went out and buried under a tree in 1962 somebody buried it Mary Diane mm -hmm. somebody buried it. why did they bury it why would they bury it? or is this something that goes back say into the 1800s or maybe into the 1700s. Now, one of the things that's difficult to believe that that's the case, it's in pretty good shape. Mm -hmm. I mean, if it had been under the earth for that long period of time, would have been able to hold up as well as it has. So, you know, now we would not have this statue Well, there's good reason that we would not have this statue, particularly if it has age to it, if we didn't have Africans living amongst us. And the reality is that African people, people from Africa, have lived amongst white people ever since this area was settled by whites in the 1700s. I mean, they have been very much involved in our lives. So, you know, that's a fascinating, I mean, how do you, do, do, I mean, I find this very intriguing. Now, you know, the first thing I wanted, would do, and you know, it's like everything else, you got to know where to go. Mm -hmm. First thing I want to know is who first owned the house where this was buried. Now that's going to be easily found out. I mean, you'd go to the deeds and find out who were the first people to buy this house in 1963. Did they own it until 1989 when these other people bought it? And then, of course, you just try to see, well, try to find some of these people. Go read the obituaries if they're no longer living. See if they had children. Make contact. Anybody in your family ever go out and bed this thing in the yard? You know, that'd be a first thing. And if, if that, you get nowhere with that, then you just have to keep digging, keep digging and keep digging. But it's, it, it, it is, it is truly a mystery that we're going to have to, we're going to have to deal with. So now, how do you, don't, don't you find that interesting? And by the way, you've been talking almost 25 minutes. Well, I don't care. I, told you. <laughs> I know that's fine. I just wanted to, it was a lot more than real, four minutes. I'm, I'm, but do you find that interesting what I talk? About? I think it's really interesting. I would like to know what the story is about that statue. Maybe somebody well, knows. See, a lot of people believe that an historian is somebody that can immediately tell you who was president of the United States in 1828. They they think a historian somebody that goes around kind of like on a quiz show, <laughs> you know, has all this junk. An historian is somebody who knows how to investigate. Mm -hmm. That's true. Because these artifacts do not speak for themselves. You have to ask them questions. And that's really what the historian is. The historian is somebody who takes an object, it can be a big object, it can be a small object, and begins asking those questions. And that's so important, as I have said before, because there is nothing more fundamental 
to a human culture than the narrative by which you define yourself and define other people. I've heard Joe Biden say that the, this election, and I'm not taking sides on politics, but I've heard him say that this past election was indeed really a battle over what is the soul of this country. Well, how do you tell what the soul of a country is? It's what's reflected in a narrative. And what builds that narrative? It's interpretations that come from historic artifacts. So we, I believe, who are in the historic preservation business are doing things that are so fundamental that they don't even, many people don't even realize they are. Now, let me talk about this. I've shown this to you before. This is the only documented structure in all of Mecklenburg County that we know enslaved people lived in. Now, I would say that from an academic standpoint, This is absolutely one of the most important artifacts in Mecklenburg County. Because it's the original structure, right? It's not a recreation. It's the original structure right. in its original location. And it's the only one that we know of that survives. And we call it the Stafford Log House because as was true with so many enslaved people, they frequently took the name of who owned it. And the Stafford family did indeed own this land in the late 18th and early 19th centuries when this building was built. Now, I believe I'm gonna editorialize for a moment. In fact, let, let me show you one thing Preserve Mecklenburg did. We talked, I showed you this before. Preserve Mecklenburg, as you know, is totally privately funded through donations. Every private nonprofit is always seeking supporters. And we spent precious money to go out and do emergency stabilization of this building. We did that in 2019. Now, I believe that the Historic Landmarks Commission, which is supported by public tax dollars, they don't have to go out and ask anybody for money. And I think they're a very important and worthwhile and significant organization. And I think they've done wonderful work, both when I was there and since I've been there, since I've left there. But I think it's their responsibility to figure out a way to make sure this building not only survives, but also that it's interpreted to instruct the public. Because when you take into account the fact that we've talked about before that over 40% of the people in Mecklenburg County in 1860 were enslaved people. And you want people to face the realities of that circumstance. One of the things you do, you need to have them go look at this particular building. Now remind me where it is again. Plaza Road Extension, just beyond the outer belt. Is it on I'm hesitant to tell private? you the exact location <laughs> because, Mary Dinah, it's so important that at this point it's very vulnerable and I would what not want to publicize its specific location. Is it and, on private land? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, although the owner, to my best knowledge, is very sympathetic to the issue, but that's the reality is that. African-American experience and history really in Mecklenburg County, I would say is divided into three periods. One from the beginnings, 
And the first really significant white settlement occurs here in the 1730s until 1865 when legal slavery is abolished. The second period from 1865 until 1965, which is the period of lingering legal restrictions on African-American people. And 1965 to the present, after the passage of the Voting Rights Act and a greater access that African-Americans particularly have to the instrument of political power, which is the ballot box. All those periods need to be have their artifacts. They need to have those things that can be interpreted. Now we talked about before that we have one other building that probably was an enslaved people's home. And it's on Robinson Church Road. And many people would never recognize it because it's just this little center section. But the cabin is still very much intact. And the Landmarks Commission owns this property and I know they will be selling it with some sort of preservation governance to assure its preservation. We had a whole program on African-American cemeteries mm -hmm. and many of those were slave cemeteries. We talked about the McCoy Cemetery which is on McCoy Road in North Mecklenburg and how the slave uh, children of the slave owners, the McCoy family, thank some of their favored slaves. We talked about the W.T. Alexander Plantation Cemetery, which is on Mallard Creek Church Road near UNCC in the midst of a, of a parking, of a, an apartment development. And this is the sign that notes its existence there. We talked about the Neely Cemetery. And we talked about the inevitable presence of periwinkle. It's a ground cover. Mm -hmm. And the Neely Slave Cemetery is almost in South Carolina. It's in the Steel Creek community, very, very close to Carowinds. Now, these places are very, very special because they are reflective of the institution of slavery. Slavery is what slavery was. Slavery was what slavery is. It's an institution. And it's important for people to face it, to interpret it, to understand it. And even though the Neely family recorded the birth of slaves in their Bible, we need to have these artifacts to be able to interpret them for the future. So these are very, very important places. How yeah, we, we did that time? whole we did that whole podcast Absolutely. Um, just about the slave Absolutely. cemeteries. Absolutely. And they're they are enormously important. You know, the Wallace House, which is the this this house, mm -hmm. the Stafford House, which is this house. And these slave cemeteries, and there are more than these. I'm not showing all of them. You right. Remember we went to more. Yeah, we did. These more. are elements of the built environment that can give a sense of depth and sophistication and understanding of the complexities of our history. And they've got to be interpreted and they've got to be preserved. And well, to answer your question, it's a it's almost 35 minutes. Well, I tell you, I'm going to break it off here, except to, to kind of give you a sense of where I'm going. And let me just talk about this issue. You know, it's interesting. I saw where a neighborhood in Charlotte known as Providence Plantation mm -hmm. has dropped the plantation name because it evokes in some people, understandably, feelings of um, memories that they don't really want to focus upon. Mm -hmm. Now, 
I'd say two things about these plantation houses, and I'm going to show you several of them. The first one, this one right here, this is Holly Bend. This is the Robert Davidson house, built about 1800. All these suckers are built after the cotton gin. It's on Neck Road off of um, Beatty's Ford Road, way out in North Mecklenburg. I'd say two things about these plantation houses. First of all, they're just artifacts. Um, you should never get rid of these things. You should keep these artifacts because they can be interpreted various ways. <clears throat> Could one say that in the past they were, they were glorified? They were made gone with the winnish. Well, yeah, I think that legitimately can be made. Should a more balanced, inclusive history be interpreted? Yes. But you call them what they were. You know, the thing that made slavery a reality in this part of the world was economics. Because what really provided <clears throat> the money for the southern, southeastern United States was cotton, indigo, tobacco, sugar, and rice. And in the case of Mecklenburg County, it was cotton. And they were labor intensive crops. So that's one thing I would say about it. Also, these are part of African-American history. In fact, the vast majority of people who lived on these plantations and the, the actual builders of these plantations were black people. Were they, did they live an idyllic life? Hardly. They were highly regimented. They were uh, completely and totally powerless legally. Uh, they indeed legally were treated as property. I'm not denying or even overlooking any of that, but this was their life. This was where they lived. Did they live in the big house? No. Are all the slave houses gone? Yes. Were there slave houses there? Yes. But they are important. And I think you ought to call them what they were. This was part of the Davidson family's plantation in North Mecklenburg. So I'll start next time going through the plantations. And then we will go from that into the buildings that reflect more the post-1865 period of the history. And we'll get some post-1965 history of African-American culture as well. So. Okay. I think, did I do okay, Mary Dana? Thanks, Dad. Did I do okay, Mary Dana? Good job as always. Thank good, you for, for being here today. Thanks everybody for joining us. We really appreciate it. And we will look forward to seeing you next time uh, for my dad to continue. And I want everybody to have a great new year. And by the way, become a Happy supporter of Preserve Mecklenburg, preservemec.org forward slash donate. You can do it for $10. We'd love to have you be a supporter. It means so much for us to know that the people of the community can. Absolutely. It's really been good. And thanks everybody who has become a member already. And Absolutely. Yeah. And you can contact my dad. You can friend him on Facebook and you can follow him on Instagram at Dan Morrill and you can email him. Dad, what's your email address? I can't ever remember. DanMorrow2 at gmail.com. Right, the number two at gmail.com. D-A-N-M-O-R-R-I-L-L-2 at gmail.com. 
Okay. So thanks again, and we'll see you next week. Take care. Bye, Bye. everybody. Have a blessed, blessed week. Thank you so much.